يحتوي الكتاب على 37 سيرة ذاتية لعدد من المصريات الرائدات في مختلف المجالات المهنية في مصر أوروبا والولايات المتحدة وكندا اسمحوا لي أن أتكلم باللغة الإنجليزية لأني عشت الخمسين سنة اللي فاتوا في بلد صغيرة بلد جامعي في صغير في جنوب الولايات المتحدة في صعيد أمريكا في بلد اسمها أوبرن على اسم الجامعة أوبرن يونيفرسيتي والبلد ما فيهوش ولا جالية مصرية أو جالية عربية فما عنديش فرصة أن أتكلم عربي وعشان كده العربي بتاعي مش ولا بد فأرجوكم تسامحوني أني أتكلم باللغة الإنجليزية The idea of the book started about a dozen years ago in the aftermath of the Arab Spring in the United States where I live. TV screens and newspapers were suddenly flooded with the images and articles about Egypt and its people. Reporters camped day and night in Tahrir Square to describe the events. What I heard and saw made me very upset, especially the portrayal of my Egyptian sisters. Having spent most of my academic career studying women in France and Canada, I am very sensitive to what pertains to women. The American media depicted our Egyptian women as illiterate, uncivilized, victims of police violence and gang rape, submissive and dominated by men. There are such groups everywhere, even in the so-called civilized world. Looking around me, I saw a different group of Egyptian ladies whose achievements were recognized and honors by national and international institutions and government around the globe. Irritated, I shared my sentiments with a few Egyptian friends. They agreed that this was wrong. Then it occurred to me to change the negative feelings into positive action to correct the flawed image. When I discussed a book idea with a handful of close friends, their response was overwhelming. Thus, the project was born. I started by asking these close friends if they would write their stories, recalling their upbringing, the values that were instilled in them, and uh, the principles that guided them throughout their lives. They would also speak of the difficulties they encountered as they rose to the top of their professions and earned the highest distinctions in their fields. Actually, the objective was three sprongs. The first aimed at attempting to break the monolithic, outdated, orientalist stereotype. The second sought to make the world aware of the modern, educated, and sharp Egyptian champions who were effectively improving the quality of life in the societies and the larger environments in which they lived and worked. The third purpose, just as important, was to provide positive role models for new generations of women and men, not only in Egypt, but also beyond, to inspire them to set their goals very high, despite the obstacles they may encounter along the way. 
I wanted to convince them that the sky is not the limit. To achieve these goals, my friends and I invited a broad sample of women born in different parts of Egypt, currently at various stages of their careers, practicing in diverse fields and occupations, both within and outside Egypt. We identified professionals who had broken glass ceilings and paved the way for other women to follow into their footsteps. I am often asked how the participants were selected. The answer is simple. These were the Egyptians we knew who were willing to take part in the project. Initially, I anticipated a sample of about 15 to 20 contributors. But as the word spread, and other remarkable pioneers and achievers were identified, the book ended up with nearly twice as many chapters. This number is both large and small. It was greater than originally planned, but it was also a very small number, as 38 is only a fraction of the outstanding Egyptian ladies who are making the world a better place. As chapters arrived and I began to edit them, I found many surprises and unexpected results. I knew all would be well educated, but it turned out that slightly more than half had doctoral degrees. The most astonishing fact was about Egyptian women engineers. They were the first women in North America to obtain doctoral degrees in engineering. Our sisters were not only the very first women in North America to receive PhDs in engineering, but they were also the very first women to serve as deans of colleges of engineering in Canada. In the United States, one of our authors was the first woman ever to head a department of aerospace engineering and to earn her university more than $50 million in research funds. Another Egyptian broke more than one glass ceiling when she was elected president of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. She was not even American. She was the first person ever, man or woman, from outside the United States to be elected to the top post of an international organization of more than 130,000 members, mostly men, and the first person from the Middle East. A recipient of a PhD in chemical engineering was offered her dream job at the Canada Center for Mineral and Energy Technology. On her first day on the job, she was very excited until she had to go to the bathroom and found out there was no restroom for women. Evidently, the architects that designed the building in the 1950s never expected there would be a woman scientist. These groundbreakers started their engineering studies in Egypt in the 1960s and early 70s when Egyptian ladies were way ahead of women in the most developed nations in the world. It is not only in engineering that our compatriots broke 
glass ceilings and achieved records. But they also excelled in nearly all professions, academe, sports, medicine, the arts, banking, development, diplomacy, economics, public relations, just to mention a few. One contributor to the book was the first woman to serve as the Deputy Secretary General of the World Council of Churches in Geneva. Another was the first Egyptian and the first African inducted into the Taekwondo Hall of Fame in Las Vegas and the youngest ever appointed to the Egyptian Senate. One of our authors was the president of UNICEF International Committee of Experts that monitored the implementation of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. The most beautiful voice on New York radio belongs to one of our sisters. In the 1990s, an Egyptian chemist was the first person, woman or man, to obtain a U.S. Department of Defense contract for her employer to refurbish the equipment of military laboratories in Belarus and to receive personal congratulations from U.S. Vice President Al Gore. These are only a few examples. From what I just said, we can safely conclude that contemporary Egyptian women are worthy of their predecessors, the illustrious and eminent queens and goddesses of ancient Egypt. For many, reaching their goals was extremely difficult. Some lost their fathers or their husbands along the way and unexpectedly found themselves assuming the responsibility of children or younger siblings. One starved herself and cried to sleep from hunger due to the rigorous diet and weight regulations of her sport. It took one of our authors more than 18 years to complete her PhD, having to raise five children in the meantime. She received the doctorate the same day that her daughter graduated from high school. Strong determination, perseverance, and courage allowed these staunch women to overcome the obstacles and achieve their dreams. Although women were the focus of the book, Egyptian men also came out as winners, breaking the stereotype of the Middle Eastern sexist macho man. Many outstanding women credited their successes to their loving and supporting fathers or husbands who encouraged them to reach their full potential. In some cases, these men proved to be more progressive than most men in the East or the West. Let me give you a couple of examples. In the late 1960s, an Egyptian husband offered to keep their six-month-old baby so that his wife could complete medical training in a different province. Another man sacrificed his own career so that his partner could pursue her own education and professional goals. These extraordinary men deserve to be applauded and recognized even as they rest in their graves today. Egypt remains rooted in the hearts of these daughters of the Nile. 
whether they live in Egypt or abroad. They are committed to serving their country, their native land, and to improve the quality of life for their fellow citizens. None expected to receive any personal or material reward or benefit from participating in the project other than to enhance the reputation of their country and its people. All royalties from sales of the book are donated to two Egyptian charities founded by two of our authors. One half goes to Benetti, an association that cares for homeless girls who live in the street. The other half goes to the Association for the Protection of the Environment, designed to improve the quality of life for the garbage collectors and sorters, the Zebelin in Mo'atam. I hope that our modest initiative will inspire others, writers, to uh, follow the path that this book has opened because there are many more treasures to unearth and many more Egyptian women who deserve to be in the spotlight. Thank you for your attention. I would like to show you some pictures, uh, actually six pictures uh, from, from the book. Uh, and I'm quoting from the English version of the book. If you have the English version of the book, you can see the pictures, but you will see them now. On page 144, uh, sorry, 145, you will see Safa Fuda, the only woman with 20 men, members of Energy Frontiers International, standing by the first oil well discovered in Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. On page 246 of the English book, you will see Madiha El Mahelmi Qutb, the only woman surrounded by more than 60 men at the United States and Canada National Board Meeting of Boiler and Pressure Vessel Inspectors in Anaheim, California. On page 254, you will see Caroline Maher at home in Cairo, surrounded by her 130 medals and trophies. On page 306, you will see Mona Reza in Minsk, Belarus, receiving a medal from Major General for services rendered to Belarus. On page 305, Mona Rez is congratulated by U.S. Vice President Al Gore. On page 314, you will see determined Faiza Wahbi Shirin and her daughter, Laila, on their graduation day, same day, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Faiza received her doctorate in the morning, and her daughter received her degree from high school in the afternoon. 